Welcome back to Smart Life. I'm Dr. Gina, and I know that, like me, you've heard some horror stories about what goes on in operating rooms. You see TV shows and really wonder what it's really like while you're on the table. So we found a surgeon who's willing to talk about what happens behind those closed doors of the OR. He is Dr. Paul Ruggieri, and he is the author of Confessions of a Surgeon. He joins us here today. Welcome to Smart Life, Dr. Ruggieri. Great, thanks. It's great to be here. Good to have you. Now, I know that a lot of your book is, is filled with positive stories about what happens in the operating room because we do want to give all deference to the fact that many a life has been saved in an operating room, but not all experiences people have in the OR are positive. Do you talk about some of those in the book? Oh, exactly. I, I talk about my good and bad experiences uh, that have affected me greatly over the years. Uh, most of them are good. Uh, some of them aren't so good. Uh, like at any other industry, we hear people talk about how much harder things used to be, um, how much easier the education is nowadays, how good people are really hard to find. Is that true also in your line of work? Uh, yes and no. I mean, I think patients really have to be more active in, in finding out more about their surgeon, particularly before they enter the operating room. You don't want to find out after the fact that your surgeon doesn't have the greatest experience in your operation. Uh, the, the, I think most of the colleagues that I know that I operate with are, are, are very top-notch people. And uh, new surgeon have to learn somehow at what point do you hand over an operation to someone who's new. Do we ever have an, an inexperienced surgeon cutting on us so they uh, can get their hands dirty, so to speak? Well, a, you know, a lot of us are inexperienced when we finish training. We're relatively green and we need a few years under our belt. And it's interesting, there's a quote from a surgeon that passed away a couple of years ago, and it, it, he stated that good judgment comes from experience, and, and bad judgment also comes from experience. But we're not, when we finish training, our experiences are well enough to qualify us to operate individual, individually, but uh, in reality, we need more time to hone our skills. People make mistakes in their work every single day, and that's part of life. But in your profession, that really is life and death. Um, tell us about mistakes that you know about and how consumers can be more watchful for these sorts of things. Well, I mean, we've all heard about the horror stories of sponges being left in people and instruments being left in people. It happens. Uh, you know, no matter what safeguards we carry out today, we, we try to minimize that risk, but it happens. I mean, me personally, in the book, I talk about some of the comp complications that I've had uh, with patients. And it really affects every, every one of us who operates uh, if we have a bad complication. We, we try to be compassionate about it and try to form a plan to correct it. But we will have them, and I talk about them in, in the book. So, you know, one of the things that I know just from being around people in your profession who are friends of mine, I remember a group of guys when I was, you know, my early 20s, and they were just finishing up their residency, and they were joking about the emergency room happenings in particular, uh, all sorts of stories that seemed so outlandish to me. We've all read those sorts of stories. Um, is there a reverence expectation? Like, obviously, if you're making mistakes as a surgeon, you're going to be called out by your superiors for that because no hospital wants that on their record. But is, is there a, a reverence discipline to the patient at all if someone's being irreverent? irreverent to that patient on the table, or is that just uh, kind of swept under the rug as long as the surgeon's doing a good job? Well, no. I mean, there are a lot of eyes watching us today. There, there are a lot of people watching our outcomes, and uh, there's nothing really that's swept under the rug uh, today at all. Just, it may be harder for people to find out about what happened in their operation, and most surgeons that I know are totally honest with people and tell the truth of what happened, just if they have a bad outcome. But most hospitals today, most state uh, regulatory bodies today, there there's a lot of eyes watching us today, and there should be. The book is called Confessions of a Surgeon. Uh, give us a confession. Uh, well, I mean, I'm not perfect, and there are times that I've injured organs in the operating room, inadvertently. I mean, when I do an operation, I don't go in there and try to purposely uh, damage an organ, but it can happen, and you have to repair it, and you have to tell patients about what transpired? There was an older gentleman I operated on. I damaged uh, a main bile duct after taking out his gallbladder. And it's a horrendous complication. I didn't mean to do it, but you know, I had to tell the family, and he needed subsequent surgery to correct that. And they were okay with that. As long as you're honest with people and compassionate, uh, you know, people forgive you. 
what, what do patients most often do wrong? What questions aren't they asking, doctor, that they should be asking of their medical professionals? I think a lot of people, first of all, don't even know why they're in a surgeon's office uh, to see them. And they have to ask, why am I here? Why do I need this operation? And if I need this operation, how many of these have you done? When was the last time you did one? And how did it go? Or when was the last time you had a complication from this operation? How did you repair it? So a lot of patients can ask a lot of questions about their surgery prior to going into the operating room, hopefully get answers from their surgeon. And so uh, for those who are, uh, you know, sort of blind, like you're talking about to this, um, one of the things that I've read, I guess, that concerns me greatly are the high infection rates getting worse all the time. My mother actually going through this right now with MRSA that she contracted in a surgery in a hospital. What's the best way that patients can prevent this? And is it better if you can to do outpatient surgery? Is it better if you can to look at some of the natural healing methods that our last guest was talking about? What's your best advice for avoiding these infection rates that uh, seem to be spiraling somewhat? Avoid spending a night in the hospital if you can. Of course, outpatient surgery is the ideal way to go if you don't have to be in the hospital. Hospitals uh, have sick people and their infections in hospitals. If you have to spend nights in the hospitals, it, that puts you at a little bit of risk. If you have to spend a night or two in the hospital, anybody who walks into your room, I would ask them, did you wash your hands before coming in? Uh, wash your hands leaving out. I mean, that's the, one of the best ways to prevent the spread of infection in hospitals. But unfortunately, hospitals have infections and, and you, you want to find a hospital that minimizes its infection rate. So just from the research that you did for your, for your book and from your own personal experience, do you think medicine is going in a good direction or a bad direction, uh, considering all the, all the political implications, uh, of course, that have dramatically changed the way medicine will be practiced? Um, what do you foresee on the horizon for medicine, generally speaking? Yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. I think it's a mixed bag. I think medicine in general is going in a good direction in the sense there's more transparency in what I do, my outcomes, there's, there's, there need to be more of that. Patients need to be more educated. There, there needs to be a public accounting of, of everybody's outcomes so patients can make an educated choice on their surgeon. So I think in that sense, there is more transparency about what's going on in hospitals, hospitals publishing their outcomes, their infection rates, physicians, surgeons, particularly it's going in that direction. And that, that's a good thing. I know one of the things that I think is so helpful. I love I love Yelp because it gives the consumer so much, um, you know, so much uh, impact and so much uh, a, a, of an ability to affect the, the service that they're receiving. And when it really comes down to it, uh, medicine is a service that you're paying to receive ultimately. And so, are there are there any? Consumer groups like that now that are sort of tracking these kinds of things, uh, critiquing doctors. I've seen some, but I know that they're massively impacted by the doctors themselves. There are. There's really nothing legitimate out there that patients can go to. I mean, hospitals know what their surgeon's outcomes are as far as complications, return to the operating rooms. I myself intuitively know what mine are. Are they published anywhere for patients to go to, to a legitimate uh, site? No, they're not. Uh, um, there really aren't any legitimate sites yet. Medicare is really pushing doctors to start publishing their outcomes, and, and they will. Um, but right now, it's you know if you know somebody who works at the hospital that you're going to go to or the operating room, you can find out a lot about your surgeon that way. One of the things I'm hearing a lot of criticism about right now is the labeling that's taking place. I forget how many new codes, thousands and thousands of new codes under Obamacare. Um, do you think this is going to impact medicine for the, for the worse? And if so, how much should patients confide in doctors if they're then going to then be codified and labeled afterwards? Well, it does. It's already impacting me, the, the bureaucracy, the paperwork that I have to fill out in private practice. Uh, it, it will. It's already impacting us, and it's going to impact us even further, probably in a negative way. Uh, but we don't have a choice. We have to, you know, fill out what we have to fill out in order to get paid. As far as patients goes, uh, it may even be a little more impersonal for patients if there's more labeling of patients. I hope it doesn't come to that, but uh, hopefully it won't. Uh, Dr. Ruggieri, where can we find you online, and also where can we get your book? I have a website. It's www.paulrogieri.com. My book is available at any bookstore on Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's widely available.
Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us. I, I appreciate anyone who's willing to uh, give us a behind the scenes look at a profession that uh, so far has been pretty closed off. So we appreciate you, Dr. Ruggieri.